Probably the most important thing to, to remember in, in good director therapy is, is that we need some monitoring to, to use it. And, and this is my disclosure. Uh, I'm a great believer that having some extra information about flow in highly surgical patients can help. I think it helps to measure the physiology better, it helps to give the fluids that we're giving better, and ultimately I believe if we put it in the context of a bundle of care, it definitely improves the quality of care that we're doing, and I believe it improves outcome for these patients too. Now, if we were talking about this 30 years ago, probably the only tool that we would have had uh, would have been the pulmonary artery catheter. And uh, I'm not going to give a lecture about the pulmonary artery catheter, but I think it's good to, to learn from lessons from the past. And uh, what I've done here, I put uh, randomized control trials that they use the pulmonary artery catheter, at least in one of the groups. And I've separated these studies between the studies that had a, a good outcome or the studies that didn't show any difference in outcome at all in these patients. And often when I ask a question, what do you think is the difference there between the studies on the top that had a better outcome and the studies that in the bottom that didn't show any outcome difference at all, a lot of people tell me, well, actually the first studies that were done earlier, so that uh, where we needed the monitors, and actually later on probably we didn't need it anymore. The interesting thing is that probably at the beginning we were clear that for a monitor to work, we also had to use, we also had to use a protocol. So just putting a monitor there, just buying a monitor to tick the key box of the uh, sequence payments is not going to work. So we need to have training, we need to have strategies, we need to have protocols together with this monitor. It seems easy uh, to think, it seems obvious, but it's surprisingly when you audit practices, often we put a monitor there, but we tend to use it more to reassure ourselves that the situation is not too bad. And that's a mind shift, because when we do goal-directed therapy, we are not really trying to stabilize a patient that is you know, markedly hypotensive. We can do that, we know how to do that. This is a strategy about trying to give the right amount of fluid to push the cardiac output, to push the oxygen delivery higher, even when the heart rate, even when the blood pressure may seem normal. So, first of all, go directed therapy means that we need to have a high risk group of patients, and I will talk about risk, and we need to have a monitor to get some extra information that we wouldn't be able to get just with our clinical examination, and we need to have a strategy, we need to have a protocol. If you ask me, would you rather have a cardiac output monitor with your protocol or a protocol based on blood pressure and heart rate, I'll take the second. <coughs> but when we do the two things together, it's very probably we do better. We've been talking a lot about mortality uh, today, and, uh, and we know that the high emergency laparotomy is a very high mortality. We're probably talking about 10 and 15% and above. But I want to talk about morbidity. Because again, that's to me, and when I started to do research in this field, was uh, a mind-changing game, understanding the concept of post-operative complications. Now, if we look at major complications in major surgery, and I don't have specific data just for emergency laparotomies, but usually patients with very high mortality, they tend to have higher complication rates. Well, if we look at major complications in major surgery, and this is data from around the world, they tend to complicate about 16, 15% of the surgeries. We're talking about myocardial infarctions, we're talking about pneumonias, and so on. And if I get one of these complications, even if I'm in the ward, often this patient will have a, a higher mortality. So these are those patients that develop a chest infection in the third or fourth uh, day. They sometimes need to have some extra physiotherapy, antibiotics. Some of these patients will come to the intensive care unit. A good number of these patients will survive, but some will die. Nothing exciting there. What about if we start to consider complications, not only the major complications, like myocardial infarctions, uh, pulmonary embolism, and so on, but also smaller complications, what we consider smaller, like, for instance, a wound infection or a urinary tract infection. Now, that's usually something for which patients do not die. But it is something that if they didn't have surgery, probably, they wouldn't get. If, I, if I'm well at home, uh, it's unlikely that I will develop this kind of complication. So the, the act of having surgery and anesthetic in a patient that is sick will predispose this patient to develop more complications. So let me come to this. And this uh, clearly is data that if we're talking about emergency surgery, is going to be even higher than this. But I want to show you this, this study because this study is very important. This study is done, was done in elective surgery by the group of Monty Knighton, that has done a lot of work on enhanced recovery after surgery. 
And you look at the incidence and complications, even in patients with low mortality risks. And what I found was that even in mortality risk groups of less than 2%, about 30% of patients will develop a postoperative complication. Now, clearly, we're not talking about myocardial infarction, pulmonary embolism here. We will be talking about urinary tract infections. We will be talking about wound infections, and so on. And you may argue, what is the big deal of having a complication if the patient is surviving in the hospital stay anyway? Well, this is the big deal. I think this is a paper that I suggest everyone to read. It's, a, it's really it's been a milestone, I think, in the field of perioperative research. And it's from the group of Curie and Dimick, and they have these massive databases in America where they're able to follow thousands and thousands of patients for many years. And as you see, they followed uh, different types of operations from uh, very high risk operations like abdominal aneurysm repairs and emergencies, but also to laparoscopic or cystectomies in, in election. And what they found clearly is that we have different survival curves for the patient depending on the type of operation. There is no rocket science there that if I have a laparoscopic or a cystectomy, my survival would be better than if I have a lobectomy for cancer, for instance. But this is the interesting bit of this paper. If I separate patients between having or not having a complication, patients that develop a complication will have a much higher mortality rate up to 12 years later. And now, the first time that I saw this line, I was a bit skeptical, because if you see the drop in survival here, it's in the first few days after an operation. So these are patients that had under very high-risk emergency surgery. They had significant complications at the time of surgery. And these patients, where they will die with a sudden event or of a major complication at the time of surgery, in the first days after an operation. So it's difficult to think that then you can then compare this with curve here. So what they've done on this side of the slide, they've done something very elegant. They removed the first 30 days postoperative mortality, which means that now I have every patient that survived at least 30 days in operation. But as you see, if I still separate patients between having or not having a complication, those patients that develop a complication will die more up to 12 years later. So this is fascinating because these are probably those patients that develop a complication they get some extra antibiotics, sometimes they need to go back to the theater for a washout. They are surviving, <coughs> they're thinking they're doing well, but just by the fact that they had a complication, their mortality risk is higher up to 12 years later. And this was true for any type of surgery, and clearly with different survival rates, and also for different types of complications. Now, of course, there are some predisposing factors here. We know that our risk assessment, whether it is an ASA score, a POSM score, or whatever we want to use is not perfect, but with the limitations of what we can use nowadays, developing a complication <coughs> was a higher predictor of mortality than preoperative risk factors. Which means that if I have what we classify an ASA2 patient and an ASA3 patient for the same type of surgery, if the ASA2 patient develops a chest infection to stop and the ASA3 doesn't, statistically, the ASA2 will be at higher risk of mortality 12 years later. These are large observational studies, and it's difficult to find a clear pathway of causality. We need to be very careful with that. That's why it's important that we also do randomized control trials in this setting. But I think we don't have to throw away evidence from large observational database like this one. And this has been replicated and is consistent now out there for any type of surgery, as you can see. Survivors with complications for the same preoperative risk factors, they do much worse <coughs> and they have a much lower survival rate years later. There are implications also in terms of cost. Again, the group of Curie and Dimic, they looked at complications in, this is data in US dollars, but I suspect that if we do the ratios between uh, having or not having a complication, it doesn't change very much in terms of British pounds. And if you see, having a respiratory complication, a major respiratory complication, Again, after elective surgery, a lot of data comes from elective surgery, I'm afraid, not from emergency surgery, where you can see that the cost goes from an average of $5,000 to $60,000. And why is that important? Because I can push this message to my management, and I can say, I want to have a quality improvement program now. I need to have some funding to set it up. But probably if I can reduce by 1%, by 2%, the rate of complications, this money will come back to the system with an initial investment. And it's not just about monitors, it's about 
engaging people, sometimes it's maybe about trying to get some extra sessions for an anesthetist, for a surgeon, and so on. And if we don't like to talk about money, well, again, there is some very important data for our patients. If my father has to have an operation, I prefer him to come back home on day four rather than on day nine. So, why did I show you all of this? Because both mortality and the complications are something that in the field of gold directed therapy has been studied for, for many years. This is one of the first meta-analyses that we published with Mark Hamilton and Andy Rose, in which we found that there was also a reduction in mortality when we were putting all the studies together in terms of gold directed therapy and ALK. And we found also a reduction in complications. The truth is that when I came to this country, I was lucky enough to train with David Bennett, who was one of the pioneers of gold-directed therapy. Uh, he died, unfortunately, a couple of years ago. But even years and years ago, when in, in my hospital we were doing this, and we have been doing studies for a while, when we were going around in conferences and in Congress and we were saying, yes, we do this, often people were saying, well, I don't have the mortality rates that you report in those papers, so I don't actually need to do uh, this type of therapy. So when our message was on mortality, we were not really able to show that maybe there was something that we could have improved in other places as well. And I think that was a mistake, probably, of focusing so much on mortality. Because it is true that if we look at the mortality in surgery, over the years have decreased massively. So for instance, we've taken the control group mortality in gold director st therapy studies <laughs> over the last 20, 30 years or so, and as you see, there has been a clear decrease in the mortality. Why is that? I suspect because mortality is something that we've always measured. If I measure something, I have a benchmark to try to implement things and to get things better, and probably to try to decrease or to improve the signal. In the industry, it's very, it's very easy, it's very clear. If I have a process that is not working, first of all, I need to measure, and then I can try to implement things and see if that's working or not. Complications, on the other hand, up to some years ago, is not really something that we were looking at. <coughs> so we decided to, to repeat um, the analysis again. And this time, rather than putting all the studies together, we wanted to see if the effect of gold directed therapy was <coughs> consistent across different mortality risk groups in terms of mortality and in terms of complications. And this is what we found. If we were looking at mortality for the lower mortality risk group, we couldn't find any benefit of gold directed therapy. And for the mortality between 5 and 20%, we found the trend, but it was not statistically significant. And for mortality higher than 20%, we definitely found a strong signal there. Now, I suspect emergency laparotomies in this country lie between this point here and this point here. So if you ask me, do you think it decreases mortality? Your real answer is, I don't know. But I suspect the highest is the risk of mortality for the patient. The more sense it makes to me, this becomes part of the bundle of care. And of course, if I have patients that are very, very well, and they need a relatively minor operation, probably, I will never find the signal in mortality there. But when we look at morbidity effect, so that means decreasing complications, then we found there was a consistent decreasing complications for all mortality risk groups, for less than 5%, for 5 to 20%, or for more than 20%. So I think, there is a signal there saying that if I have a group with a high mortality risk group doing gold directed therapy, probably is helping in reducing surgical complications. Fascinated by the work that Curie did in America, we thought, why don't we do a follow up of an old gold directed therapy study? And uh, in uh, 1993, Boyd, Grounds, and Bennett published a study, it was the second one after Schumacher, and 15 years later, we decided to see, let's see what happened to the survivors of that study. And we found that if the patient was randomized to the gold directed therapy group, they had a median increase in survival for more than three years. And this is interesting because this is a, a therapy that was done just around surgery. It was quite intense, actually. It's not as you would do it now. It was starting even pre-op, intra-op, and carry on for 16, 24 hours post-op. So very intense treatment, indeed, to the extent that that was never translated into a real application in clinical practice. That only stayed as a study. What we do in my hospital now is slightly different. So we just start in theater and we carry on in the ICU. 
So I presented a lot of clinical data there, and recently we started looking at this also from a cost-effectiveness perspective. Um, if I have another few minutes, I, I want to show also the, a little bit of terminology in cost-effectiveness analysis, because I think it's something that sometimes we're not very familiar with. So I'll be very brief. Usually when we look at cost-effectiveness study, we have quality, which is quality-adjusted life years, and then we have cost-effectiveness ratio. How do they work? A quality goes from 0 to 1. 0 is dead, and 1 is a full health year. Okay? So if I'm able to extend my year in, in great health of one extra year, then I gain basically one quality. So how does it work in practice? Let's imagine, and this is just a, a, an example that I, I've made up, but let's imagine that I am scheduling a hip replacement. Okay? Now, the first year, I may argue that the quality of life is 0 0.7. That patient needs physiotherapy, has got a bit of pain after the operation. You may argue that the first year after the operation may be even worse than what it was before the operation. Then it improves, and then the next two years is even better. What if the patient doesn't have any? What if the patient doesn't have any operation at all? It can happen. We decide not to have an operation. Well, that would be 0 0.77 times 5. So we have 4.1 quality adjusted life years if I decide to do an operation. This is 3.85 if the patient decides not to have it at all. That has got a cost. And this is my gain, 4.1 minus 3.85. As a society, we need to decide how much we're happy to pay for any of these increments. That's how quality adjusted life years and cost effectiveness analysis work. So, in practice, if we put the cost of an intervention, we put the effect of an intervention, then we can see that there are some uh, interventions that cost more and do less benefit, and we all agree we shouldn't be doing that. We never have arguments with our <coughs> management about it. Then we have some interventions that may be less costly, but they have less benefit. And that's where sometimes we have arguments with our management because they say, why don't you do something different? We believe that there is less benefit there and we are against this. If it costs less and it brings more benefit, well, then we shouldn't have any arguments because we are reducing the cost and we're bringing more benefit for the patient. This is really where cost effectiveness comes. So there is more benefit, but there is more cost for the system. And then the society will decide how much we're happy to pay. And in the UK, in the US, we're talking about something between thirty to $50,000 of something that we say, I'm happy to pay for one quality adjusted life year more. So we looked at this for our post-operative protocol. We take only high-risk patients in our intensive care unit. And we map everything. We looked at all costs, from the preoperative assessment to coming to the intensive care unit and to see what happens if the patient goes to the ward and to develop complications and etc. Having more direct therapy compared to standard of care had a lower cost, and that's mainly due to complications and the cost of the ward. Now, what is the cost per patient? This is the cost per patient, which is basically a very small percentage, but it's something that we have to invest in every single patient. We are doing, it's a little bit like doing a vaccine. I can't have a risk assessment tool that is telling me in this moment, I do it only in the patient where it works. We are simply not good enough at that at the moment. So I need to accept that I will select risk in a population of patients, and some of the patients may receive the, the intervention, even if maybe they were not necessarily in need of it. So I need to invest pretty much in everyone. Now, we've done a sensitivity analysis on this, because uh, uh, my managers may decide well, you have a great intervention here, but doesn't really decrease mortality, may decrease some complications. How much does it really cost to treat that complication? May not be ethical, but they may tell me, I'm actually happy to pay for the complication when it occurs, other than paying all of this money in all of these patients. So the breaking point would be when the complication costs 1,325 patients, uh, 25 pounds per patient, when the intervention, sorry, costs something like that. This is how much it costs now, 280 pounds. And if I have to start from zero in a similar intensive care unit, where I've never done that, I need to get monitors, I need to get training, audit, <coughs> protocols, and etc. On the first year, it will be 325 pounds, which means that all of this is gaining. So in my hospital, I would say, what we're doing at the moment is not even cost effective, it's cost saving, because we are spending less overall for treating these patients in intensive care at least this way. 
Now, I've shown you a lot of convincing evidence there, but it is true that more and more we are seeing pay, uh, studies coming out, and either they are not positive, so there is no difference in the groups, or we are seeing sometimes also some possible harms in some groups. I'm going to quickly go through some of this. This was a, a quite a, an important paper by Chan in the British Journal of Anesthesia, in which they did colorectal surgery, they did gold-directed therapy, and they were also able to see how fit the patients were aerobically, so assessing that risk as well. And what they found was that even in terms of hard clinical outcomes, there was no difference. When they were looking at the patient, if they are ready to be discharged or not, patients that were in the gold-directed therapy group, if they were relatively fit, actually they were doing worse than the control group. And I suspect this is telling us a lot. We can think that this is something that is going to work in every single patient. And probably if patients are cardiovascularly fit and they're undergoing relatively low risk surgery, I suspect it's something that we don't need because we may run the risk of just giving fluid challenges repeatedly, and if we don't stop, we may just overload our patient. But in higher risk groups, I don't think we have this evidence of negative or harm. This is another important study that came out last year in German. Rupert Fields was a chief investigator, again, go direct to therapy versus usual care. And they found a reduction of complication from 43.4% to 36.6%. The P was 0.07, so if you just read the abstract of that paper, we have to conclude gold directed therapy doesn't work. However, I didn't look just at the abstract, I looked also at the electronic supplementary material, and this is a very interesting analysis there, which was not a fishing exercise. This was a secondary analysis that was planned even before uh, the study was started, so it wasn't the initial protocol. And the idea is that we're not really testing here a statin or an aspirin or a new blood pressure medication. We're testing a process. Gold directed therapy is not just giving a monitor and give some fluids. We need to teach how to interpret the results from the monitor. We need to teach how to do a fluid challenge and how to interpret the results of a fluid challenge. So they say, why don't we analyze the data with and without the first 10 patients per center? Well, the idea that 10 patients was a sort of a number to decide that with 10 patients probably I have made my learning curve. I know how to, to work with this. And this is interesting. If I look at the first 10 patients per site, I may almost see that there is a, an increased harm of good directed therapy for <coughs> standard of care, even if it was not significant. Left. But if I remove the first 10 patients per each site, then suddenly the reduction in complications is significant, which is almost a statistical paradox. I now have a study which is smaller than the one before. I probably have investigators that are trained to deliver the treatment. The reduction in complications becomes significant. So, one of the questions that we had when we started to see some of the negative study was, well, do we really have evidence that gold-directed therapy is harmful? Because, to be fair, if there is an intervention that is beneficial, at least in the higher risk group, and there is a potential that may not <coughs> make benefit in other group. At least I want to know, is there evidence that can cause harm in some patients? And we thought that because we are doing interventions that are giving fluid, sometimes giving inotropes, maybe cardiovascular complications could increase in this group of patients. So we didn't find any difference at all. Actually, we find that patients receiving gold directed therapy, at least in the study that reported the rate of cardiovascular complications, they had even a lower rate of cardiovascular complications. So I think we can say, that is safe. I'm going to conclude with the last few slides. Um, this is something that uh, my friend Neil uh, gave me, and we've been talking about this for the full day, so I'm not going to go into detail. But Gold Director Therapy was part of that quality improvement program. I don't think I can tell you that was the magic bullet that works. I suspect it was just part of the treatment, but it definitely worked. And uh, uh, hi, I'm Italian, as you may spot from my accent. I was in the UK when uh, we had the Olympics, and it was amazing to see how many medals the cyclists got for the UK. And when you read what they, the way they were training, they were saying sometimes if even just moving from hotel to hotel, you bring the same pillow. And I think there is this attention to details in the bundles that we put, doing the same things more and more times, trying to do it all the time. I think these things pay. And of course, gold-directed therapy is not going to work if you don't have all the other things together. 
uh, give me a good surgeon and a good anesthetist and a monitor rather than the opposite. But when we do all the other things together, I suspect there is enough evidence there to say for the high-risk group, and I think emergency laparotomy deserves to be considered high-risk group. I think there is evidence that we can improve outcome. And this is similar to something that we see not just in anesthesia, but also in intensive care and in, 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 many, in many quality improvement process. I've been involved in, in the IMPRESS study, which was a study that we've done in, across the world. I was the chief investigator for the UK. And we looked how people are compliant with bundles of sepsis according to the surviving sepsis campaign. We always think that we're already doing things very well in our practice, but the UK was the second big contributor with the US the first one, so I think we have a lot of data for these two countries. And if you look just at the compliance for something very, very simple, like measuring a lactate, giving prospectum antibiotics to patients in sepsis, only 50 to 60% of the time. If you say that three hours is too fast, well, the six hour bundle was not really much better in patients who were already in need of this. So, if we are looking for a magic strategy that is going to solve all our problems, but it's not going to work, we need to do all the things together. And I think we, we have data pretty much from everywhere in the world that when we put bundles together and we increase the compliance, the mortality and the care of our patient gets much better. So to conclude, and there is no really randomized control trial looking just at emergency laparotomies and go directly to therapy, but there is a lot of data out there that shows that if we have a high risk group of patients and we define high risk as a mortality risk group of more than 5%, probably causes no harm and I suspect it can improve complication rates and sometimes mortality. And until we don't decrease massively the mortality of emergency laparotomy patients, in my practice it is something that I do routinely. Some data on cost effectiveness analysis, but I think is going to be a big question mark for research. <coughs> because we need to look at the old process, not just at what's happening in hospitals and etc. Uh, it's not really a magic bullet, but to me, it's part of a high quality care. Thank you.